O oh, daughters of Zion, O oh, Abraham's sons, hear the words of your father, hear his promise of love. I will make you a blessing, so count the stars if you can. You will be a great nation I will give you this land Welcome to our evening service. We will be having choir practice again Wednesday night at 6. Our Sunday school concert is on the 17th and it's the evening service. We'll be having that. And I want to remind you of prizes for OCA, Ocean Christian Academy. What we do is each year we get some prizes to take to the children so if they don't have something to give to a friend or to their family member or whatever, then we provide that for them. And there's a table over there with some on it, and if it gets filled up, we'll put another table in. Yes. And we got a lot of tables. <laughs> Isabel, I need something out of your bag. I listened to Michael Youssef today. He's sort of my replacement for Charles Stanley. Charles has gone home to be at the Lord. Most of what we hear from him now is repeat. But it's just as good as it was the day you give it to. And this is what I wrote down. Do not compromise your faith. That's kind of what the background was. A young hunter was out hunting for bear, hoping to get a bear skin coat to keep him warm. Just then a grizzly came along, and so he put up his rifle to shoot. He paused, and the bear backed off. And the bear said, must we do this? There must be a compromise we can reach. So the young hunter put down his gun to discuss the situation. The bear said, if we compromise, we can both have what we want. You want a bear skin coat? I just want some food. Two minutes later, after the young hunter laid down his rifle, the bear walked away alone. His belly was full, and the hunter had a bearskin coat. <laughs> the point of the story is the devil is just like that old bear. He wants us to compromise. To compromise what we know from God's Word, and when we decide to serve God, He wants us to compromise from that. But the end is never good when we do compromise, is it? He's a liar, he's a deceiver. And his desire is seeking his will, which is to destroy God's people. He can't hurt God, but he'll be after us. Remember the story of the old bad man. Our first song is number 435. Yeah, no. 435. My faith has found a resting place. Yours has it. When you're here tonight, I hope it does.
God, I just pray that you'll be with all parts of this service, God. Uh, Lord, may we go away from here being drawn closer to you, and may we learn something as we delve into your word later on. And in the end, may we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Our continued scripture reading is found in Leviticus. We continue on. This is the last of the feasts mentioned in Leviticus 23. Starting at verse 33, we'll read down to the end. And this one's regarding the Feast of Tabernacles. Leviticus chapter 23, reading from 33 down to 44. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be a feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, a grain offering, a sacrifice, and drink offerings, everything on its day. And we read about those earlier. Besides the Sabbath of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord, also, on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. And you shall take yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever. This wasn't meant to be temporary for the Jewish people. Forever in your generations you shall celebrate it the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths, or little shelters it means, for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths. And I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. And that was the last one of them. We thank God for his word. Mm -hmm. Hymn number 157. Anybody like Christmas songs? Yeah. 157. Sing a little bit about the coming of Solomon. Mm -hmm.
It's entitled, Our God Comes. It's the first Sunday of Advent. And so we'll read this responsibly and responsibly. The Lord God of Israel said, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill may go. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The sovereign Lord comes to power, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his law like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, and he tears them close to his heart. Thank God for his word, for his love. And the next hymn is number 167.
Jeremiah, he had a little depiction of Mary and Joseph and the procedure to how Christ came. And in the depiction, I said, why are people so young? It just, it just never struck me how young Joseph and Mary were. They were only just teenagers. And yet, they reverenced the Lord the way they did. They lived through scrutiny, the first part of their lives. And if it hadn't been for angels appearing, I don't know, things wouldn't have probably worked out the same as they did. But God always has an angel prepared, or something, or someone prepared. And he, He's got something that He wants for us to do. It just just couldn't understand them being that young when I looked at it. It's, it's probably still on television if you want to look at it. It's pretty good, did you? Yeah. I didn't finish it, I got it taken. Has anyone got anything they'd like to share before I read the next scripture, which is found in Isaiah 9? Tremble 
evening, take your Bibles out and turn, if you would, to Psalm, the second Psalm, verse 7. Psalm 2, verse 7. We might call this our first Christmas Bible study for the year of 2023. Turn to Psalm 2, the second Psalm. And this second Psalm, which is Psalm 2, I've already told you that, haven't I? Probably done. It has much to say to us about Christmas. As a matter of fact, it is actually a Christmas song. Look at Psalm 2, verse 7. Psalm 2, verse 7. The Lord Jesus Christ is speaking here. And he says, I will declare the decree the Lord, that is Jehovah, hath said unto me, meaning Jesus, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And so it's, it's a psalm about God's Son, the only begotten Son, the one who was born on Christmas Day. And so I want to speak to you this evening on this subject. When will there be peace on earth? When will there be peace on earth? Because Christmas is it not is all about peace. And many of us have sung the Christmas carol, I am sure. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, the old familiar carol plays. And while the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, I thought of how the day had come now, where there is anything but peace on earth. And he goes on to say, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then peal the bells, more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. And so the question comes this evening, when is that peace going to come? And how is that peace going to come? Because there's no doubt about it, the old prophet Isaiah said that his name is the Prince of Peace. I think we read from that this evening. And when those angels appeared, Luke 2 verse 14 tells us that they were there singing glory to God in the highest, and on earth, what? Peace and goodwill toward men. Yet we look around this evening at a, at a world that is torn with war this evening. I mean, look at the Ukraine. And look at the Middle East. Look at Gaza tonight. Look at Jerusalem tonight. You have, have you ever seen more going on internationally and domestically? More wars, more skirmishes, more terrorism, more fear more upheaval than ever before as we look at this world that we live in tonight. When the United Nations meets in emergency sessions and the diplomats get together the plan for peace, but it don't come. And so our world is not at peace. Our world is in pieces. I mean, there's difficulty everywhere. And those who are the so-called intellectuals, and I stress that so-called intellectuals, just don't have any hope. Of peace. No peace. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, that great and brilliant literary giant and Russian dissident, he, uh, he said this many years ago. He said this, and I quote, It is too late to avoid a third world war. And those were heavy words back then, certainly even heavier this evening. And the great wartime Prime Minister of Great Britain, Britain old Winston Churchill, before he died, he just simply said, our problems are beyond us, Winston Churchill. And then another man with a great mind, Albert Schweitzer, said this. He said, man has lost the capacity to foresee and to forestall. And then Schweitzer said this, and I quote him again, he will end up destroying the earth, Albert Schweitzer. Henry Kessinger, who just died a couple days ago, well, Henry Kessinger. Secretary of State in the Nixon and Ford administrations, international diplomat, as it were. He stood in that war-torn Middle East way back in the 1980s, and with tears streaming down his cheeks, he said this, he said, one has to live with a sense of inevitable tragedy. And that was way back in 1980. And those were heavy words in, and as I said, they are mighty heavy words this evening. And yet 2,000 years ago, a baby came. A baby was born. And that baby was called the Prince of Peace. But since then, we have anything, we've had anything but peace. 
And all of us who are living today feel like that we're looking into the end of a loaded cannon. We're just wondering what is going to happen next. We wonder when we get up in the morning and snap on the news, what am I going to hear this morning? In our cities, our swamps of discontent, where hate breeds, and our homes are broken with battered wives and battered children today. And we have a divorce epidemic. And people who walk the streets of our cities, they have no peace because they just don't know what maniac is lurking just around the corner. And many of them this Christmas season are trying to find peace in the mess of a bottle or a pill or a toy or a possession or some cheap thrill of some sort. So tell me if you can, folks, this evening, where in the world is the peace on earth? And the Bible says... There is no peace, saith the Lord unto the wicked. So the question comes, were the angels mistaken when they spoke of peace? Was Isaiah wrong when he spoke of peace? Is there no Prince of Peace? Will we ever have peace on this old globe? Okay, with that in mind, I want you to look at Psalm 2. Because in Psalm 2, you're going to find out that the answer is right here. You're going to find out that the Lord Jesus Christ has not failed, nor can he fail. Remember, there's another song we sing, and it goes like this. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States, said this. He said, I had rather temporarily fail with a cause that must ultimately succeed than to temporarily succeed with a cause that must ultimately fail. And always bear in mind, always remember, that in all of this that's going on, we are on the winning side. And what you have in Psalm 2 is a prophecy of the ultimate triumph of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, who came into this world on Christmas Day almost 20, or excuse me, almost 2,000 years ago. And if you look at and study these scriptures, you will see that there are four voices, predominantly. There are four voices that speak to us in Psalm 2. First of all, I want you to see as we read these, uh, these first three verses, I want you to see, number one, the sinful people speak. The sinful people speak. Because like today in these scriptures, there is a world in frustration. In a world in anxiety. And I want you to hear what these sinners say. Now notice in Psalm 2 verses 1 to 3. It reads like this. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. And the rulers take counsel together. The kings set themselves. And the rulers take counsel together. Against the Lord. And against his anointing. Saying, now here's what they say. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And this is exactly what the world is saying this Christmas season. I'm talking about the nations. What the Bible calls here the heathen. I'm talking about the unconverted people of the world. Here's their voice. First of all, it's the voice of violent rage. Look at Psalm 2, verse 1, which asks this. It says, why do the heathen rage? Do you see what rage is? Do you know what rage is? Rage is what you do when you don't know what else to do. Isn't that right? I mean, have you seen anybody just flying to rage and just get right in the face? It's because they are frustrated. And when you get in a rage, you don't have a clue many times what you're saying because you're out of control. And rage is what you do when you don't know what else to do. Now, the world tonight is in more than anxiety. I mean, the world is raging. The world is completely out of control. We look around and we look at the world of science and we're afraid of what we've created because our inventions have grown our wisdom today. We just look around at the world and there's no way out. It seems that there's no way out. A French philosopher said this, there is no exit from the human dilemma. And he was so right because there seems, there seems to be no way out. 
We are in a mess tonight. Again, look here at what the heathens are saying. First of all, there's a voice of violent rage. And then there's a voice of vicious rebellion. Look again in Psalm 2, verse 2. It says, the kings of the earth set themselves. Here they are talking, taking a stance. And it seems they are set. I mean, it seems like they're determined. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel. The rulers are scheming. They're scheming. They're taking counsel against who? They're taking counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. And the answer to the question number one, why do they rage, is in Psalm 2, verse 2. It's because they are in rebellion against Almighty God. Because they just simply in their pride have set themselves against the Lord and against His anointing. Now, notice the text against the Lord. The word Lord there is Jehovah. Then look at the text against His anointing. The word there, the word there is Christ. The word anointing means the christened one or the Christ. And that is in our world today... A determination against the Judeo-Christian ethic. Against the God that the Jews know as Jehovah. And the God that we worship is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a universal rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ this evening. When Jesus came into the world on that Christmas day some 2,000 years ago, He came into the Roman world of government. Jesus came into the Greek world of culture and he came into the Jewish world of religion. And all three of them set themselves against Jehovah and against his anointing. And today the world of government is against the, is against the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very obvious and very clear here in Canada and the United States that our government is doing everything it can, can do to say, and I quote, Whatever you do when you celebrate Christmas, let there be no governmental recognition of Jesus Christ. They don't want that. They say, take away the manger scenes, take away the stars, take away the shepherd. We'll have Christmas. But be sure to leave Jesus Christ out of Christmas today. And I think there's a, I think there's a, uh, there's a, a group afoot that don't want you to call it the Christmas season anymore. They want to call it Winter Wonderland or some crazy thing like that, or Winterfest. And so the world, the government, and the people are against the Lord Jesus Christ. They've set themselves against the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, my friend, is the attitude they have towards Christmas today. The world of government is always against the Lord Jesus Christ. We think we're so smart with our government today, or they think they're so smart today. I don't think they're smart, but they think they're smart with their government today. But we just move from one dilemma into another dilemma. We just won't move from one mess to another mess. People's been in the messes before, but they've never been in a message like they've been in this evening. And not only is the world of government against our Lord Jesus Christ, but the world of culture is against the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine me going to Dal Dalhousie or St. Mary's, now, I don't know why they want me there to speak, but we'll just say that I did, and I went in there to Halifax, and I stood up there saying, ladies and gentlemen, the answer to the world's dilemma is the Lord Jesus Christ. They would crucify me. they just simply lock me away as a crackpot, would they not? And yet, human wisdom has failed us. But hold on now. Hold on, because not only is government and culture against our Lord Jesus Christ, but another sad truth is the world of religion has even rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that you can go to many churches that bear the name of Christian and very seldom hear the name of Jesus Christ even spoken? And if you hear his name, it's probably in a patronizing way. And there are many churches today that don't believe that he's the virgin-born Son of God, or the only way to God. They don't believe that today. And many churches are little more than glorified country clubs with a steeple on top. So what do you have? <clears throat> First you have violent rage, and then vicious rebellion. And then that ends up in what I want to call the voice of vain reasoning. Look if you will now in Psalm 2 verse 2. 
The Bible says that the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel. That means it's not just something that they, that they let happen. That means it's something that they have planned and schemed and hatched up to happen. In Psalm 2 verse 1, look at the, world, look at the word imagine. Do you see the word imagine there? The people imagine a vain thing. And if you look at Psalm 1 verse 2, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. In Psalm 1, verse 2, the word meditate. And in Psalm 2, verse 1, the word imagine are the same word in the Hebrew language. So this imagination doesn't mean just some vain thought, because this is something that the kings of the earth have thought out. This is something that they have meditated upon. And what this is, it's worldwide humanism, View It's a worldwide humanistic view of a, a, that is against Almighty God. There is a movement in the world today to rationalize eternal truth. I think I spoke about that six or seven months ago. Nazi Germany did it. Soviet Russia has did it. And we are doing it in Canada and the United States of America today. Because we see what's happened in the 30s with the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. We see how the Jews were treated then, and we see tonight, this very night, how the Jews are being treated now. And the way they treated tonight looks like a photocopy of the 1930s. And so there is a violent rage today. And there is vicious rebellion. And there, there is vain reasoning. And then we wonder why we have no peace on earth. Do you, did you know that in 1945, all of the people who ran the UN, the United Nations, which I think stands for United Nothing, they got together and in order to appease the godless communists, they said this, and I quote, We will leave out any mention of God whatsoever in our charter. And that is United Nations. I mean, all the people of the earth got together to plan for peace, and they say, we'll break the bands asunder, we'll cast their cord from us, we will get together, and we will plan for peace on earth, and we will leave God in. And since 1945, take notice, the world has never known more wars, never, since 1945. More wars since that period of time than any other time in history. Indeed, the voice of a sinful people. All right, now the next thing I want you to see this evening, I want you to see not only the voice of sinful people, folks, but I want you to see a sovereign God speaks, because now God begins to speak. God begins to speak now. And look, if you will, in Psalm 2, verses 4 to 6. Psalm 2, verses 4 to 6. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them. They've spoken against him. They spoke against him, but now he's going to speak unto them. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Okay. In all of this noise, the voice of Almighty God comes a thundering through. And I want you to listen to what God says and what his voice says. First of all, what his voice is. First of all, his voice is the voice of derision. It is a voice of ridicule. Psalm 2 verse 4 says that the Lord shall have them in derision. That is that the Lord himself shall laugh. The Lord himself will ridicule. And he shall mock them, the Lord. And so I want to be perfectly clear here because when God laughs, he doesn't laugh because he thinks it's funny. This isn't the laugh of humor. It is the laugh of divine irony. Why? Because how are these puny men sticking out their big chest, shaking their fists in the face of Almighty God, and saying, God, we don't want you to tell us, we don't want you, God, to tell us how to rule the world. We don't want any strings attached to us. Just leave us alone, God. We can get along fine without you. And God looks down from heaven and God laughs. It's a voice of derision. But not only is the voice of derision, it's a voice of displeasure. Look in Psalm 2, verse 5. The Bible says that then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. 
God is going to judge this whole world. Make no mistake about it. God's going to judge this world. God is going to speak in His wrath. And God is going to speak there about the great tribulation. And the great tribulation may be very near. The Bible calls it the great day of His wrath. And just before He sets His King upon His holy hill of Zion, God is going to speak in His wrath. And we may be very close to that great tribulation. We may, we may be very close to that time when the Antichrist will reign and rule. Because we can see more signs of Antichrist today than we've ever seen before. Because all over we're seeing all of these signs. We're seeing all of these signs. We see it. The world, the world as it moves toward a one world government. We are seeing today a push for one world currency. We are seeing today a move toward one world religion. Everybody thought it was wonderful a few years ago when the head of communism and the head of Catholicism met together and they said, isn't that wonderful, people said. The world is finally coming together. Politics and religion now are beginning to merge. And so the stage is being set, folks. The stage is being set. And so God speaks, first of all, in his, in his derision. Then God is going to speak in his displeasure. And then finally God is going to speak in his determination. The great verse in all the Bible is Psalm 2, verse 6. God is speaking and he says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And what, do, what does he mean when he says, yet? He means in spite of everything that these people have tried to do, in spite of all of their rebellion, in spite of all the rambling of the atheists, in spite of all the scorn of the liberals, in spite of the ignorance of mankind, and in spite of the scheming of Satan, God says, I'm going to crown my king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Of Zion. And so no wonder God laughs, because all these people are take, talking about what they're going to do, and God says, I'm going to put my king upon my holy hill. Do you know what he's talking about regarding Zion here in Psalm 2, verse 6? Do you know what that stands for? It's Jerusalem. The very city where they crucified him is the city where God is going to crown him. He was crucified one time there, 2,000 years ago, but God is going to crown him this time. It's in Jerusalem. And in spite of all that man can do, in spite of all that man can scheme for, in spite of all that man can work for, I am going to crown my king in Jerusalem. I don't like games. I really don't. But have you ever played checkers? Everybody's played checkers. And again, you ask games, I don't, I don't like playing games. I just get so bored so quick. Hey, so, eh? what's that? There you go. But two of a kind, not with yeah. You know the idea of checkers is that you just keeping, keep on moving the man against the opponent, opponent till you move your checker right into the king's row, and then you say what? Crown him. Crown him. And that's what God is doing as he moves his men in place on the checkerboard of history this very night. God is just simply playing, playing with the kingdoms of this world. He's just simply playing checkers with the kingdoms of, oh, they think they're in control. They're not in control. God is just playing with the kingdoms of this world. And you see the kingdoms, they're just moving back and forth just like checkers on a checkerboard. But Almighty God is getting ready to move His king in the king's row and to say, crown him, Amen. crown him. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And God set His heart on this, and that's when there's going to be peace. There's not going to be any peace until the Prince of Peace rules from Jerusalem. And that's the reason the Bible says that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Right now, this very evening, as I said, the, the world is torn in war. There is war in Ukraine. There is war in the Middle East. And it seems like the storm clouds of the battle of Armageddon are, are just on the horizon. And it looks like the great tribulation that will come before the battle of Armageddon is at our doorstep. But Almighty God has one purpose in mind. He's going to set His King upon His holy hill of Zion, and all hell cannot stop it. Amen, folks? Amen. Yeah. 
we've heard from the sinful, or we've heard the sinful, sinful people speak. We've heard the sovereign God speak. Now let's hear the, the saving son as he speaks. Because now the Lord Jesus Christ begins to speak. And he speaks in Psalm 2, verse 7 and following. Listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ says. Jesus said, I will declare the decree of the Lord, that is Jehovah, has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possessions. And here's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. Here's what the saving son says. Listen to the voice. First of all, he speaks of his divine position. He says, the Lord says to me, you're my son. And this world will never settle the sin problem until this old world answers the son question. Until you know the son of God. Let me give you a verse to put there, to scribble down on your piece of paper this evening. John 3, verses 35 to 36. You need not turn to it. I'm going to read it. Just scribble it down there. John 3, verses 35 and 36. And this is what it says. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand, has given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and him that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so here the Son speaks of his divine position. And then he speaks of his divine purpose. In Psalm 2 verse 8, look at Psalm 2 verse 8. God the Father says to God the Son, He says this, Ask of me, and I shall give thee thy inheritance, the heathen, for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, you know Satan came to Jesus, and Satan said to Jesus, Jesus, you worship me, and I'll give you, Jesus, the kingdoms of this world. You just bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. But Jesus knew Psalm 2, and Jesus knew verse 8. Jesus knew that all he had to do was ask the Father, and the Father would give him the kingdoms of this world. And there's coming a time when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign. Make no mistake about that. And when he does then, and only then, will there be peace on earth. The prophet Isaiah said, They shall not, they shall not hurt nor destroy in, in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the earth. The Bible says that the wolf shall also shall dwell with the lamb. And there's coming a time, the Bible says, men shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Isaiah 2 verse 4. But not only does the Son speak of his position in verse 7 and his purpose in verse 8, 8 but he speaks of his power in verse 9. His power in verse 9. Look in, verse, look in Psalm 2 verse 9 if you would. It says that God the Father, here he's speaking to God the Son. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That is God's power. Jesus came the first time to redeem. But folks, he's coming the second time to reign. And when he came the first time, they put a wilted reed in his hand, did they not? They crowned him with thorns. They put a purple robe on his back and they mocked him and they laughed at him. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him. When he comes again, there will be no mocking or laughing because he's coming with a diadem. And in his hand there will not be a wilted reed. There will be a rod of iron that will not bend and will not break. And he's coming in power and glory to reign and to rule. And it's then that God will set his king upon his high holy hill of Zion. Yes, the sinful people speak. And indeed the sovereign God speaks. Save it, and the saving son speaks also. And now, the seeking spirit seeks. See, excuse me, the seeking spirit speaks. See how this psalm ends. After God the Father and God the Son speak, then God the Holy Spirit speaks. Look in Psalm 2, verse 10. The Holy Spirit gives us what we call, first of all, a word of exhortation. Look at it there now. It says, Be wise now thereof, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. The high muckety mucks, the intellectuals, the philosophers, the government rulers. God the Holy Spirit says, be wise, be very wise. And if 
you want a word of wisdom, here is a word of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. I'm preaching this evening from the book of wisdom that was written for this Christmas season. And it was written for those of us who live at the end of the age. For those of us who are facing the great tribulation. Now we're getting before God sets his king upon his holy hill of Zion. And God, the Holy Spirit says, be wise. Be wise. Hear what God has to say. There's a word of exhortation. And as Angie comes, keep your Bibles open. There is a word of invitation. Look in Psalm 2. Verse to Angie saying, no, that's right, we've got a psalm on the overhead. Excuse me, sorry about that, Angie. Just stay seated there if you want. Psalm 2, uh, verses 11 and 12. It says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. What does David mean by what he says in Psalm 2, verse 11? David means that it's the kiss of submission and that it's the kiss of love. Kiss the Son as Mary kissed his feet as, as she anointed his feet with oil as she wiped the oil away with her dark hair and bow in submission before the Son of God in exhortation. That's what David is urging people to do, to bow in submission before the Son of God. Then he says, kiss the Son. Kiss the Son. And that is the invitation. And then finally there's an admonition, meaning a warning. Look in Psalm 2, verse 12. Kiss the Son lest he be angry. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. People today, I've heard it so many times, and you've heard it so many times, and the joy boys have preached it. They have said, but God is a God of love. Indeed, he is, but he's also a God of wrath. He's a God of mercy, but he's also a God of judgment. And there's a battle now going on between the mercy of God and the judgment of God. In the raging waters of God's wrath are ferociously pounding against the dam of his mercy of his mercy. But one day, one day the dam of God's mercy will give way to the judgment waters of God's wrath. What God is saying is this: God is saying, listen, listen and be wise. That's the exhortation. That is the warning. Kiss the sun. That's the invitation. At least ye perish. That is an admonition. That is the warning. The warning. And folks, if there ever was, if there ever was ever a word, word for our generation tonight, it is the word of God. It is the word of God. Finally, to the last verse, the last part, it says, Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. And put their trust in the king. The Hebrew word trust here means refuge. Blessed are all the people who find their refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, today people try to find their refuge in their money. They try to find their refuge in their government. They try to find refuge in the leaders, and prime ministers, and presidents, and kings. But they can find no refuge in those. I'm going to end with a little story, a little illustration, as you know, I like that. A little illustration done some, at some time. There was a man in a foreign country overseas, I know not what country it is, and it was announced that the king of that country was going to come down the road in an open limousine. All the subjects could see their king. They could see their king. Their king was going to ride right through the heart of their city. And so a man asked some people in charge, he said, what would I have to do to see the king? And he said, well, there's going to be a great crowd there. You need to get up early. You need to find a place right there on the curb. And don't let anybody elbow you out of the way because it's going to be a big crowd there. If you want to see the king, that's what you're going to have to do. He said to his friend, I've never seen a real king before. So I made up my mind, he said, that I was going to see the king. He said, I got up very early, and I got my place right there on the curb, and people began to squeeze and to jostle and, and to push me, but I stood my place, he said, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and my legs got tired because it was a long wait to see my king. But I waited and waited and waited. And he said, and the crowds gathered, and the crowds gathered, and they pushed, and they jostled. 
he said after a while, he said I could hear, hear some noise, a tunnel. I could hear the noise. He was coming, he said the king was coming, the people were cheering. As the king's motor came, got closer and closer. And they were saying, the king is coming, the king is coming, the king is coming. He said, my heart began to beat and to flutter, he said. I got ready. For the first time in my life, I was going to see a king. He said, then the king drove past, by, drove past. And he said, I've never been so disappointed in all my life because finally it dawned on me that the king was just a man like myself with a nose and ears and hair and a fancy suit on. Just a too late king. He went past. The man said, the king. He said, I tried to analyze why I was so disappointed. He said, I tried to analyze why I was so let down. He said, what was it? What happened? And he said, when I went away, I understood the whole thing. He said, you know why I didn't get excited? You know why I was so let down? He said, because it was because he wasn't my king. He wasn't my king. He said, as a matter of fact, he didn't even know my name. And folks, I'm telling you something tonight, and it's this. Our king is coming. And when he comes, he's going to know our name. Amen? Amen. He calls the sheep by their name, the king of kings. The Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, is coming. And he'll know your name, that's for sure. The Christ of Christmas is coming again. And Jehovah God says, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And when he does come, it's then and only then there will be peace on earth. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the only way to peace. And our Lord Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And our Lord Jesus Christ is the only true King. Amen, folks? Amen. Father, we thank you for your message this evening, God. I just pray that people that are listening out there on our church Facebook, or those that might not be here this evening, would open their hearts and receive Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as their personal Savior and Lord. In His wonderful name I pray. Amen. Travis, if you will. Happy faces are going to line the hallways. Those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended, those from prison he set free, little children and the aged, hand in hand, stand all alone, and those who were crippled, broken, ruined, now glad in garments white as snow. Yeah.
mass this evening that maybe Donna was closed with some friend, Donna, if you would. Dear Lord and Savior, we thank you, Lord, again tonight for the wonderful word in your promises of your eternal. And then you all well know our names, mm -hmm. each and every one of us that have accepted you as our Savior. You just told us, Father, to believe what you did on the cross of Calvary. It's a simple thing, a gift you give. But, Lord, many have not bowed their knees or their hearts to you. So, Father God, I pray tonight that the some that have not heard the word, their ears were not open, but yet they had a question in their heart. I ask that they would remain and talk to somebody about your salvation, your plan, Lord, that you have for them. We will praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.